Shalom, peace and blessings. Welcome to the Fourth Angels Learning Center. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. And we are on our Romans chapter two study. We will be breaking down Romans chapter two. Uh, so get your pencils, get your pens for your notes. And uh, we're going to dissect now. One of the things I want to remind everybody is that we are harmonizing what Paul is saying with what the Torah and the prophets teach as well. So we're not going to leave that aspect out. We're reading through Paul's letters in order to reveal that Paul is not creating a new religion, a new perspective on scripture, nor is he creating a new set of scriptures. If you guys haven't already, go back and check out uh, the Meet Paul for the First Time video, where we talk about how to examine Paul's letters. Um, you'll you'll learn a lot more from that video. So this one, we're going to just use what we talked about <clears throat> and go right into chapter two, okay? So let me pull up chapter two for us. All right. Romans chapter two. So let's start. Uh, where we left off, we left off with analyzing who he Paul was talking about in chapter one. Now, I made a claim saying that Paul was actually talking to the nations, newly converts from different nations uh, or nations outside of Israel. And now we're entering into chapter two, and chapter two is now going to discuss the the Jew aspect of the people of Yah. So he's going to say, he's going to be talking to those who grew up understanding the law and things like that, and how they are dealing with the new people from different nations that is coming into the relationship with Yah. So let's, let's start out. So verse, we're going to read uh, the first 10 verses. And it says here, starting from verse one, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O oh man, whosoever you are that judge or condemns. This The aspect of this is condemnation, not judging, saying that you're doing something wrong, but judging, saying that you are condemned for what you're doing, uh, especially speaking on behalf of Yah, saying you are condemned in his eyes. This is unacceptable at any point in time, you know. Besides referring to literally what Yah is saying in the scripture, if Yah has declared this in the scripture, it is okay to relay that message to someone else. But when you are looking at someone and saying that they have no hope, that they have nothing for themselves because they're not doing something in line with what you think, we need to kind of examine that. So it says, for you are inexcusable, man, whosoever you are that condemns or judges. For wherein you condemn another, you condemn yourself, because you that judge do the same things. So this is always, Paul is constantly uh, making aware the importance of self-reflection, the importance of what the lesson that Messiah taught with the beam in your own eye, the speck in your brother's eye, but the beam in your own eye. So he's talking about that in, in the act of condemning someone else, which does not mean that they're condemned, by the way, in the act of condemning someone else, you are ending up in a position of self-condemnation. You are putting yourself outside of mercy by doing things like that, especially since you also do things that's equivalent to what they are doing. It's not necessarily when it says the same things. It doesn't mean that you are doing the same exact actions, even though it can refer to that as well. It is referring to doing things that are likely worthy of condemnation. Let's continue to look. It says, but we are sure that the judgment of Elohim is according to truth. You see, so Yah judges, but it's according to truth against them which commit such things. And do you think this, O oh man, that condemns them which do such things and do the same, that you will escape the condemnation of Elohim? Or do you despise the goodness and forbearance and long-suffering? Do you, do you despise that Yah is good, that he is willing to fight and strive with you or willing to be 
to endure for a time your your mistakes and your rebellion and your iniquity. We can look through the whole history of Scripture and see that Yah's character is not only in executing righteousness and judgment, but it's also in extending mercy, time, forbearance, and enduring and suffering with you so he can turn you from your way, so he can cause you to turn from your sins. What he does is he extends that time to, to educate you, to strengthen you, to point you in the right direction so you won't have any excuses. This is what this time is for. So he says, do you despise Yah's goodness, forbearance, and endurance? Um, this is not knowing that the goodness of Elohim is what leads people to repentance. But you're sitting here trying to condemn another person when Yah himself is extending that time in order to show goodness and, and uh, long-suffering to that person. So it says, but after your hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous the condemnation of Elohim, the condemnation of Elohim, who will render to every man according to his actions or his deeds. Now, I want to point this out. I want to point this out. It says here, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing Look for glory, honor, immortality, and eternal life. So those who are patient and continuance in doing good, their, their actions manifest that they're looking for righteous rewards. Then it says in verse 8, to them that are contentious and that do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish, upon every soul of man that does evil. So let me say that again. Them that are contentious, let me say, let me let me highlight where we're supposed to stop reading. Those who are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, comma, this is what is for them. Watch. Indignation, wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul that does evil the Jew first, and also those of another nation. But glory, honor, peace to every man that works good or actions manifest good to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles or to the nations. So I want to stop there and I want to start manifesting that Paul is not just coming up with this stuff out of his head. To look at someone and condemn them rather than extend mercy is outside of the character of Yah. Yah, Yah's character is, according to verse three and four, is, I'm sorry, verse uh, four and five, is to extend his goodness, his forbearance, and his long suffering. So let me let me break these words down so that way we can use more simple words than forbearance. G463 is the word for self-restraint, and tolerance. Now, when Yah uses the term tolerance, he's not, um, you know, trying to relay that he's accepting your sins or accepting your evil. What he's doing is he's allowing time before he executes something. So there's something that he's restraining, according to this definition, self-restraint. And it says here, the, the root word of this is, is to hold oneself up against or to put up with, or bear with endurance. So let's look at this. His goodness, right? His moral excellence, G5544. I want us to use the simple words so that way we can understand clearly what Paul is saying. His moral excellence, his character, right? The way that he responds in kindness, his moral excellence, his forbearance, which is his self-restraint, and his Long suffering, G3115. This word is long animity. It's like that. It says forbearance, but it's, it's emphasizing on patience, waiting, right? Fortitude. Let's look at the root word. The root word is 
endurance and temper, restraining the temper. So now when we look at this, we see that he's talking about wrath. As if you notice here, it says, after the hardness and the impenitence of your heart treasures up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of Elohim. So there's going to be a manifestation of Yah's wrath towards wickedness. And what Yah is doing is he's restraining that wrath so that way he can extend his goodness and manifest to you that he's being patient with you, that he's restraining himself from extending his wrath to you so you can see his goodness. And then he says, do you not know that the goodness of Elohim leads people to repentance? When you are acknowledging that he is trying to help, when you're acknowledging that he is trying to wait, that he is trying to um, save you or deliver you from something that's happening wrong, he reveals that to you first. He extends that mercy to you and he restrains the wrath. And, but he says that day is coming. So he's doing all of these things before that day, before he says it's time. When that time comes, it says he's going to render to every man according to his works. And so let's look at a few verses. And, and there's a lot of verses that Paul is getting and learning these things from that the people at that time has forgotten. It wasn't that he was dealing with a, a bunch of people that understood the scriptures, understood the messages that was in it. No, the, this, the apostles, the, the New Testament was written to reiterate things that were lost. When Messiah came and he was teaching, he said that you can't understand what I'm saying because you have moved away from what was written. He's bringing up the prophets, but they could not understand what the prophets meant because they have moved away from the understanding of it. So this is what Paul's mission is for the nations, for them to grasp an understanding of the messages that was in the past. This is how they can accept Messiah. This is how they can walk in righteousness, by accepting those writings. So he's trying to paint the picture and allow them to see the, the messages in the scriptures clearly. Let's go to Job. Job chapter 34 is going to show the harmony of Paul's message here. Uh, looking at verse 10 to 12. So let's go to Job 34, verse 10 to 12. And it says, therefore, hearken unto me, you men of understanding. Far be it from Elohim that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit lawlessness. For the work of man shall he render, he's going to repay man, and cause every man to find according to his ways. Yes, surely Elohim will not do wickedly, neither will Almighty pervert judgment. So Yah is going to not pervert his judgment. He's going to execute his judgment accordingly, not according to how much, how angry he is, not according to how much he hates what you've done, according to your own ways. Verse 11, for the work of a man shall render he, shall he render unto him. My own actions will um, supply or will relay how the punishment should be, my own actions. Um, and many people are understanding this principle. They just don't want to realize that it's a, it's definitely going to happen for things that they want to allow. You see what I'm saying? Like they want to allow certain wickedness in their life so they don't enjoy the aspect of uh, this judgment. But when we go to court, we like to say that justice is only based off of the things that we believe is too heinous or is too wrong or wicked. But you don't understand the concept of wickedness, the concept of what is wrong and what is right has to come from an original source. It has to come from somewhere. Somebody made an understanding or gave us an understanding of why murder, pedophilia, all of these things is wrong, even though those things are being blurred at this point. There's a lot of things that were deemed worthy of death that is being blurred as far as being they're being tolerated in not in the sense that Yah waits for a person to repent, 
but they're being tolerated, meaning that they're accepting the things that people are doing wicked uh, because uh, they're making their own judgment calls. But Yah is going to bring this judgment according to every man's works, just as Paul said. Let's look at the prophet Jeremiah. Just to see another witness, um, just confirming the same ideas, right? Now, it doesn't mean that he's quoting Jeremiah, quoting Job, just because he says the same or similar statements. I know a lot of people think that sometimes people are quoting and proving that certain books are true because they're saying similar statements. That's not a quote. Quote is when it says it is written. Sharing an idea is just showing that two people have the same idea. That's all it's showing. It's not showing that one person is quoting the other. So we can't use a verse from one of Paul's letters or one of the New Testament letters to say, oh, this is quoting the book of Enoch or the book of Adam and Eve. No, unless it says it is written, then they're quoting something that was written. Jeremiah 17, 10, it says, I, Yahuwah, searches the hearts, right? He searches the hearts. He tries the reins even to give, to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So according to the fruit of his doings or the intents, right? Because the fruit, it, it derives from within the tree. So there's a seed and then there's nutrients and something that comes from inside the tree is manifested outside. So Yah is not only going to judge according to the actions on the outside, but he's also going to judge according to the fruit, the root, the, the, the intent and the motive of where those actions came from. So this is what Paul was saying. Let's go back to the let's go back to Romans just so that we can recognize what Paul was saying. So Paul was saying this um, when he says that Yah was going to judge righteously. He was going to judge them according to the condemnation that they was relaying, and he was explaining that Yah was extending time and patience. Uh, so people can repent. So verse six, he says that Yah will render to every man according to his deeds. And then he says, he talks about first those who are patient. And he talks about the, the beauty and the glory and the honor and the immortality and the life. Then he talks about the disobedient, right? Verse 18, those who do not obey the truth and, uh, and obey unrighteousness. And he talks about Wrath, indignation, tribulation, and anguish. <clears throat> so if you notice, there's these blessings that in verse 7, Paul is talking about receiving blessings in continuing, right here, in patient continuance in doing good or obedience. And then he says that there's a curse on those who do not obey the truth. Now, I know many of us know where that's located. It's located in Deuteronomy uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, where it talks about the blessing and the cursings. And I want to just show that this is where he's getting his idea. We can have these conversations and relay what's in the scripture without having to quote verbatim where it's from. All we're doing is we're accepting the principle of what the scriptures are saying. So we're relaying it according to principle. It doesn't have to be verse for verse to be the same. Moses says here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, looking at verse 15, it says, I have set before you this day life. Remember what Paul said, they, they were looking for eternal life and immortality, life and good, death and evil. In that I command you this day to love Yah, your Elohim, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply Yah, your Elohim, shall bless you in the land where you go to possess it. But, verse 17, but if your heart turn away so that you will not hear, right? You're disobedient, but shall be drawn away and worship other deities and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish, that you shall not prolong your days upon the land where you go to possess it over the Jordan to possess it. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your children may live, 
verse 20, that you may love Yah, your Elohim, which is the crux of what people say the New Testament is teaching. This is the crux of the manifestation of the Torah. The Torah teaches love. It actually describes and it shows you how Yah describes love. So that way, man, evil man that needs deliverance from not only the world, but also themselves, that evil man may understand the description of how love is supposed to look. Because they do away with Yah's laws, they look at they look within themselves to create and conjure up different definitions and meanings of love. And then they think that whatever they display should be good enough for someone else to accept. And this is not true. There's many people who have been abused by their spouse that claim that they love them and also have been deceived themselves, saying, get punched in the eye and say, hey, he loves me, though. Why are you still with him? Well, he loves me. So look at what it says here, that you may love Yah, your Elohim, that you may obey his voice, that you may cleave to him because he is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in a land which Yah, your, Yah swears to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Let's swing back to the New Testament, the book of James. Sometimes the people, they claim that James and Paul are at odds when in actuality, they are absolutely in harmony with each other as well as in harmony with the Torah. Verse 25, it says, but whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. Remember what Paul says, in patience, continue, patient continuance and continues in it. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, meaning obedience. Remember it says good work. If you look into the law and do the work, what is that saying? That you're doing the commandments, that you're keeping the law. This man shall be blessed indeed. Now, this is a perfect statement here. If you look into the law and you do the work, this is brings us back to Romans chapter 2. What does it say in verse uh, 7? To them who by patience, continuance in well-doing, right? Doing the work. Seek glory honor, immortality, and life. But it says, to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, that means that they do not, they do, not do the work. And they obey unrighteousness, means that they do not obey what is righteous, which is the law. This is what Paul is saying. The same thing that Moses relayed, the same thing that James relays, it's the same thing that Paul is relaying. Okay, let's come back here, harmonizing uh, chapter two with the prophets. It says here, for there is no respecter of persons with Elohim. Now we're understanding this principle. There is no respecter of persons with Elohim. Now, this goes into a lot. So I'm not going to go into, into this, but if you want to see a breakdown pertaining to the nature of how Yah judges you utilizing the law, you can go to James chapter two. But I want to show what is what is he relaying here? There is no respecter of persons with Elohim. He is actually quoting from Leviticus 19. Let's go there. Leviticus chapter 19. Remember, they don't have a New Testament. So he's quoting from the scriptures here. All right, so it's here, verse 15. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. This is what he was telling the Jews not to do. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. You shall not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Right? In righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. So you notice that. Right, the poor, the person, you sh in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. This shows that Yah is not partial between poor, rich, whatever it is. He is not partial based off of what you are claiming to be. 
Let's look at this. I think it's James chapter 2. Right here. My brethren, have not the faith of our master, Yahushua Messiah, with respect of persons? For if there comes into your assembly a man with a gold ring, goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, what is he about to teach? James is literally about to teach the principle in Leviticus 19.15. So he says, if these two type of people come into your assembly and you respect him that wears the gay clothing and say to him, you sit here in this good place and then you say to the poor person, you stand over there or you sit under my footstool. Are you not partial in yourselves? Are you become judges of evil thoughts? It says, hearken, my beloved brethren. Have not Elohim chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom, which he had promised to them that love him? But you despise the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Look at what it says in verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you have a respect of persons, you commit sin and is, trans and is convinced by the law as a transgressor. So again, the royal law, doing well, loving your neighbor. This is not Ten Commandments. Let's go back to Leviticus. So Leviticus 19, verse 15 down, and it talks about this in verse 18. It says, you shall not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahuwah. So the royal law is convicting a respecter of persons. This is what Paul is relaying the principle that is located in the Torah. Let's look at the next 10 verses in Romans chapter 2. We're on verse uh, 12. Well, let's read verse 12 to, to 20. It says here, For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged or condemned by the law. We just read this in, in uh, James chapter 2. It says that you are convicted of the law as a transgressor. You have sinned. If you are being partial, the law is convicting you of sin. It says if a person in the law, meaning that they have knowledge of the law, they shall be condemned by the law. For the for it's not the hearers of the law that are just before Elohim, but the doers of the law that shall be just before Elohim. So it's interesting how there's this claim, the exaggeration, like there's the reality of faith alone, which we're going to run into, is very clear throughout the scripture. And we're going to talk about that at another time. But the definition of faith alone that Paul uses in his writings has to be in line with what he's saying here, or he's contradicting himself. Do, are you justified by what you do or what you think in your mind? You see, Scripture always combines the two. James, he combines the two. Show me your faith by your works. If I say I have faith and don't have works, how can you prove it? How can I see that you are of the faith to trust you? You understand? How can I allow you to lead if you're not manifesting the actions? How, how do you go from cursing? How are you cursing and saying you believe? How are you stealing and saying you believe? How do you do those things that are contrary to you and say you believe? Where's your works? Where's your actions? Where's your manifestation? So again, it says the hearers of the law is not justified, but the doers of the law. When you hear the law, your desire should be to obey because you desire and believe and trust in Yah. You, when you trust and believe in the one that speaks, then you do what is being spoken because you trust in that person that's speaking. 
if you hear the person that's speaking and you don't do what they say, how can you profess that you trust him? It doesn't connect. So again, Paul is teaching obedience is a manifestation of justification. Verse 14, for when the nations which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. I want to stop there. This is many times is read so fast that they don't stop to see that the na the nations were who, who who people refer to as gentiles they don't have the law and we're going to define that in verse 12 uh, where it says without the law i'm going to show you what it means they which have not the law and it says this do by nature the things contained in the law what many teach is that the law is being removed and done away with. So why would the spirit cause the nations to do the things contained in the law if the law is being taken away? You see the contradiction there? Why would the very spirit that teaches you you are free from the law cause you to do by nature the things contained in it. It's the spirit confirming that the law is not done away with, which is why the spirit is still causing you to do what it says. Let's look at this verse. I want, let's go back to verse 12 now. I want to show you what this statement here without the law actually means. Now, this scripture, it comes from G460, and it says, lawlessly, right? Not amendable, without law, right? Without law is lawlessly. Those who are, have, do not have it. Like they, they never read it. They are without the understanding of it. So even though they are living lawless, they do not have, they never had it to analyze it. They do, they never had it to study it, to live it, to grow up in it. They didn't have it that way. So when they receive, when they hear the word and they believe, the spirit causes them to do that which is contained in the law. Let's go back down to verse 14. When they have not the law, you see that? When the nations have not the law. Let's go to G3551. Oh, sorry. It says nomos, which is law. Oh, I'm sorry. This is so they having they have not the law. They don't have the law. I need I need us to understand that. So when it says they have not the law, it's simply saying that the nations was not they they were not aware of the law. They were without it. It didn't say that now that they believe, they're just going to forget about the law. They're just not going to engage in the law. That's not what it's saying. The law is in the scriptures. How can you be taught the scriptures or told to follow the scriptures? By Paul, let's look at that. How can you be told that all scripture is given by inspiration of Elohim, is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness? Verse 17 says that the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We know what good works is, obedience. Why would we say that scripture is used for this? And then the only scripture that they had at the time was the law and the prophets. So the nations, when they would be converted, they would pursue a study of the law and the prophets. This is why the spirit, according to this verse here, this is why the spirit caused them 
to do that which is contained in the law. So verse 15, it says, to show that the work of the law written in their hearts, the Spirit took this law, put it in their hearts, and then it says that by nature they did it. They did what was in the law. So it says, while their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, meanwhile accusing or excusing them. So now they're they're being convicted by the law that the Spirit put in their hearts to do something or not to do something. It is the law itself is being used by the Spirit to direct what they should do and what they should not do until they study and see what Yah wants them to do and what he wants them not to do. It says, in the day when Elohim shall judge or condemn the secrets of men by Yahushua Messiah, according to my gospel, but you are called a Jew, you rest in the law, and you make boast of Elohim, and you know his widow, and you approve the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. You understand, you see being instructed out of the law. You see the things that you should approve. You understand his will, right? Verse 19, you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind because the, you're instructed out of the law. You are, because of the law, and yeah, of course, a light to them that are in darkness. So to have the law is to have light. Remember, thy word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path, because you have it and they are without it. You're supposed to be a light to guide those who are in darkness. You're supposed to be an instructor of foolish, of the foolish, a teacher of those who are babes or immature, which have a form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. All right? Let's look at this. Now, let's go to a few, few verses real quick before we continue. Isaiah chapter two, uh, 45. Isaiah chapter 45, looking at verse 25. Uh, maybe we may have to, we may continue. It says, In Yah shall the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. So in, in him shall we be justified. We are justified in him. So when we are told to obey, in not obeying, we actually contradict our justification. We go against that justification. Let's look at uh, well, let's let's go back to Romans. To be in him is also to obey him. You can't be in him and disregard what he says. That's that's not a reality. Verse one, uh, 21, it says, you therefore that teach another, do you teach yourself, right? All these people who look at the law, do you teach yourself? You that preach to another man about the law, that they should not steal, do you steal? See, he wasn't saying throw away with the law. He was saying you guys are condemning people, but then you guys are not doing the law yourselves. And I'm going to show you a verse where Messiah himself tells them they're not doing the law. Let's look at this. Verse 22. One second. It says, you that say a man should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You that despise idols, do you commit sacrilege? You that make your boast in the law through breaking the law dishonor, do you dishonor Elohim? So it's not, <clears throat> think about this. Paul is not saying, well, the law is done away with. So you breaking all these laws, it doesn't do anything to your relationship. But he's saying, if you're condemning someone and you're not doing it yourself, verse 24, 
the name of Elohim is blasphemed among the nations because of you. And then he quotes a scripture from the prophets. And he says, as it is written, for circumcised verily profiteth if you keep the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the circumcision keeps the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? If a person who is uncircumcised keeps the righteousness of the law, look at what it's saying, guys. It's saying that an uncircumcised person is manifesting what the righteousness located in the law. Should not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision because of his righteous keeping of the law? Shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it is fulfilled, if, it, if he fulfilled the law, meaning he completes the law, he's talking about the nations. The nations is fulfilling the law, meaning that they're completing it, they're doing it, they're manifesting the obedience to it. They will judge you, it says, who by the letter and circumcision transgress the law. The problem is that the Jews are transgressing the law, and those who are believing in the Messiah and receiving his spirit are doing it now. You see the difference? This has nothing to do with no law. This is actually showing that those who are converts to belief in Messiah is actually doing the law while those who claim to be believers and students of the law are actually breaking the law. Look at what it says in verse 28. He is not a Jew that is one outwardly, neither is circumcision one outwardly of the flesh. He's talking to Jews who are outwardly circumcised. He's not saying Gentiles are Jews. He's telling the Jews that you need to stop focusing on what is outward. He is a Jew talking to the Jews. A person is a Jew when they inwardly, they are circumcised of the heart in the spirit, not in a letter whose praise is not of men, but of Elohim. Not outwardly. John the Baptist says the same exact thing when he says, stop saying to yourselves that you are the children of Abraham. Do you not know that Yah is able to raise up stones to be children of Abraham? Stop talking about your outward relation to Abraham. This is what he's saying to the Jews. He's not saying that Gentiles are now Jews inwardly and all of that stuff. He's not saying that. Jews is a, is a particular family. It's a tribe. You see, Israel is the people. Everybody is an Israelite amongst 12 different tribes of families. But everyone is an Israelite because they enter into the relationship with Yah that he had, the covenant that he had. So uh, just like Abraham being Abraham's children. So with that being said, let me show you a few verses. Why is he telling the Jews that they're not keeping the law? Well, let's look at what Messiah says here. John chapter 7, verse 19. It says, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keep the law? Why are you trying to kill me? You trying to kill me and none of you are keeping the law. And then he talks about circumcision. I've done one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision. Not because of Moses, but because of your fathers, right? Abraham, Genesis chapter 17. And you on the Sabbath day will circumcise a person, right? If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, which is good. You see that? Are you angry at me because I made a man in every way whole? So you, you circumcise his flesh so you can keep the law. But then what about every other thing inside of this person? Do not condemn according to the appearance, but, con but judge righteously, righteous judgment. Condemn righteously. So <laughs> if you're going to condemn something, let it be correct. Let's go. Let's look at a few verses real quick. Second Samuel. And this is what Paul is saying. He has never indicated at any point in time that the Gentiles or the nations no longer keep the law. He is actually saying that the spirit is moving them to keep the laws 
that the Jews were, that they studied all their life, are breaking. Messiah says in John 7, 17, these guys are not keeping the law that they were given. 2 Samuel chapter 12, looking at verse 12 to 14, it says, it says here, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against Yah. And Nathan said to David, Yah have also put away your sin, and you shall not die. Howbeit, because of this action, because of your actions, you have given great occasion to your enemies of Yah to blaspheme. The child also that is born shall surely die. So his actions, because he's showing the nations, right? Because he talked about his enemies. David was sinning. Not only was this act, right? This act that he did secretly is being exposed to Israel. Not only is Israel hearing about it, but his enemies are hearing about it. And it's saying that he's blaspheming because his actions are actually breaking Yah's commandments in the sight of Israel and the nations. He is blaspheming Yah in front of them. What does that mean? Your disobedience to Yah affects how other people look at Yah. They look at Yah like he's not powerful, that he's not real that this this word is not true this is this this is the importance in our disobedience this is why it's so crazy that when he's like hey the nations are receiving the spirit and they're doing by nature what's in the law and then you're trying to condemn them because they don't know all of it and then you're not even keeping the things that you know you're the problem not them let's go to ezekiel Let's go to Ezekiel. We're going to really break down um, Paul's writings because it's it's intertwined with the law and the prophets. It's not separated from it. To separate it from it is to create all these different type of philosophies. Paul is not teaching philosophy. He's very structured. Everything he's saying is a principle from within Scripture. Ezekiel chapter 36, looking at verse 16. Look at what it says. It says, the word of Yah came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dealt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way. Their actions defiled the land and their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanliness of a removed woman. Wherefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols, and they had polluted it. It says, I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the, their countries, right? According to their way and according to their doings, I have judged them. So now they're spread around the nations, right? Now watch this, watch this. When they entered into the nations where they went, they profaned the holy name when they said, now watch this. They profaned Yah's name when they said, these are the people of Yah and are gone forth out of his land. This is what, this is how they profaned his holy name. You are the people of Yah, and you got kicked out of the land for your sins, but I pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel have profaned among the nations where they went. So you showing them that you are it's just like Jonah. Remember when he was on the boat? He was on the boat. They asked him, what's going on? He says, I'm a Hebrew. And he said, this is my fault because I'm running away from you. So he is showing them that the same people that's profaning you. And so when they saw that after executing the judgment, throwing him off the ship, that the storm stopped, they worshiped him. But if he wasn't judged in front of them, they would not fear Yah because he is running away from the commandments. Who is extremely loyal to their false deities? No, no one is. 
If you can't even obey, you can't obey even false deities. You're going to make reasons why you're doing something different. Oh, it's okay. You, you know, this false God will understand. And now they're doing the same thing with Yah. Oh, Yah will understand that we don't, that we break his commandments. He's going to understand. You're blaspheming him among the nations by disobeying him in front of all these people and then claiming to be the children of Yah. It's crazy. It's crazy, but it's real. It's real and it's sad. And this is why there's such a high responsibility. Such a high responsibility to walk even in private according to what Yah says. And Yah is merciful. He's merciful towards us which is why we shouldn't be condemning anyone else. Look in your private life. See how Yah is merciful there and show mercy to others in public. You know, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, When Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to blame. For before a certain uh, came from James, he ate with the nations. And when they came, he separated himself, fearing being afraid of them that was of the circumcision. The other Jews that was there with me separated themselves just like them to the point where even Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the true good news, I said to Peter before them all, are you being a Jew? This is what Paul said in Romans chapter two, you being a Jew living like a, a Gentile or living after the manner of these idolatrous nations and not like a righteous Jew, why are you telling the people that are in the nations to live like a Jew? So if you're not living like a Jew, why are you telling the nations to live like a Jew? This is the same thing he says in Romans chapter two. If you're, if you're teaching them to keep the commandments, do you keep the commandments? This is what he said in Romans two. So we can see Paul is very consistent. In his principles, if you are going to be a man of Yah and you keep the law in front of the nations, you are you are going to be held and responsible to keeping up the righteous standard. So Paul is holding Peter to the righteous standard. You moved yourself away because these Jews came because how the Jews felt about the nations. But then you want to tell the nations to act like Jews when you're not even acting like the way that Jews are supposed to be. So the term Jewish, is, uh, it comes from the, the name Judah. It comes from the Hebrew name Judah, which means um, Yahoo is praised. But look at what he's saying. If you're going to be embody the name Yahuwah is praised and then live contrary to Yahuwah's word, you are not a Jew. You are not praising him in your actions. You're not praising him in your lifestyle. You're not praising him with your heart and mind because you are prejudiced. You, you are partial. You don't want to be seen with the nations when they come. But when they leave, you want to eat with them. So Paul was like, how are you telling them to live like Jews? So what were they, what were they teaching the nations? <laughs> Think about this. What were they teaching the nations? They were teaching them to live as the Jews live. So it's interesting how many people, they separate the Jews and the Gentiles or the nations, and they say that the Jews can keep the law, but the Gentiles didn't have to anymore. So why is Paul saying, why are we compelling the nations to live like the Jews? What were they doing? They were teaching the nations to keep the law. So when they received the Spirit, they were doing by nature, nature the things contained in the law, but he was also pointing out the wrong of the condemnation of the Jews, that they were condemning the nations for the things they did not do. But then he looked at them saying, are you doing everything properly? They're trying to do what they, what they have, what they're learning, and you learned it. Are you doing what it says? To condemn another person? This is what Paul was teaching in Romans chapter 2. He was not teaching the separation between Jews and Gentiles. He was not teaching the, the, the removal of the law from the nations. He was showing 
in, in I'm not sure if it was like a rebuke. He was showing in a manner of rebuke to show the Jews that they need to do better because the nations are coming into this faith and they're walking according to the law. So they are the ones that's going to judge you, not the other way around. So I hope that this was enlightening. Chapter two, we're going to go into some deep stuff because Romans has a lot of information in it. And we're going to be harmonizing everything together, showing that the scriptures, not only Paul's writings, we looked at James' writings, we looked in the book of Acts, and we looked at the prophets in the Torah. We're going to keep on doing this to show that Paul didn't teach what many people are claiming he's teaching. And people are creating a new gospel, a new religion that is not matching up with the religion and the teachings and the gospel of the, of the scriptures. And that's the bottom line. You know, so you have to reevaluate your established organizations to make sure that it lines up with what the scripture says, rather than just lumping and connecting yourself with these labels and these groups. You need to follow what the scripture says. This is what Paul teaches. All right. So um, praise Yah. Look forward to the next Roman studies class. We're going to be doing Romans chapter three. This is going to actually surround uh, more of what people take out of context in regards to the law. So if you could read ahead, that'd be great. Um, but make sure next time you have your pen and pad, because there's going to be a lot of breakdowns that I believe is going to be very important to kind of not only understand the arguments that's going on right now, but also dismantle the false arguments that's being spread like, like fire. So I look forward to that study. Um, so shalom, look forward to our next study.